Last time we well, talked a little bit about uh, some features of the Earth's gravitational field that you probably haven't thought about before. Uh, gravity on the geoid. Uh, uh, does water flow uphill, downhill? Uh, can, it, can it flow uphill? Um, oh, swells on the ocean surface and their relationship to um, um, sea bottom topography, the presence of sea mounts and uh, spreading ridges and <clears throat> transform faults and and so on. One one of the points that we've been making is that the gravity anomalies that we're interested in in geophysics are often quite small. Uh, here we have we mentioned this the last time the uh, uh, gravitational field variations over the Taze River Valley and um, producing anomalies of about minus 2.5 milligauss and you're probably wondering well are we talking about <clears throat> are we talking about antimatter here um, no we we aren't really talking about uh, anti anti gravity antimatter uh, it's just in a relative sense the negative sign uh, refers to uh, the value of the anomaly relative to uh, the background <clears throat> relative to the surrounding area. Uh, we also talked a little bit about units and uh, milligauss, 2.5 milligauss, 2.5 times 10 to the minus fifth meters per second square, and uh, so on. Milligauss, microgauss, gravity units, and the like. Uh, here we've got a feature over uh, a subtle uh, um, collapse feature over an underground cave and it's producing an anomaly of a, again negative 0.4 milligauss which would be to use the microgauss would be 400 microgauss and we did talk earlier about the EM34 um, 10, 20, and 40 meter intercoil spacings uh, we do have the 10 and the 20 meter intercoil spacing measurements of terrain conductivity across this feature and you can see that the terrain conductivity decreases over the rim of this collapse feature and that's most likely due to lower conductivity and fractured well drained areas along the margins of this uh, uh, collapse feature <clears throat> So again, you know, a very small, very small anomaly that we're interested in. If we start looking at the, you know, more regional scale features, just just using West Virginia as an example, you get relatively high anomalies over areas that have a thinner crust, and uh, thinner crust that means that the mantle, higher density material, is closer to the surface, so we get higher anomalies there where the mantle is deeper, the crust is thicker, we have a thicker accumulation of lower density granitic uh, materials, and we see these gravity lows. <clears throat> this uh, Rome trough, or also known as the Eastern Interior Lockagen, is actually a depression in the basement, and uh, one of the things we'll probably talk about later, we'll show some models that indicate that the uh, surface veneer of sediments really doesn't contribute or doesn't reproduce the kinds of anomalies that we see on a regional scale. So the anomalies that we, we're seeing on a regional scale go from uh, over a range of about uh, 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 40, 44 milligauss or so. <clears throat> so we'll talk more about these features the next time, but for for now, let's let's talk about the um, variations of g that are a function of distance from the center of the Earth. And it, you know, as you might imagine, if just thinking back to Newton's universal law of gravitation, uh, the further away we are from the center of, of the Earth, uh, if, you know, if r sub e increases, then the acceleration due to gravity is going to decrease. So. This is just a, a factor that really has nothing at all to, to do with geology. Uh, it's just simply due with your distance from the center of the Earth 
and um, uh, you know Newton was able to to show in his character is his characterization of the uh, gravitational field of the Earth that basically the Earth could be considered to gravitate as though all of its mass were concentrated at the center. And we'll take advantage of that when we're talking about uh, simple geometrical objects and trying to approximate the anomalies that the, those objects are going to produce. Um, you know, if we take a look <clears throat> at this relationship, we've got R sub e here in the denominator, and we ask ourselves, okay, well, if I, you know, raise my gravimeter, if I walk up the stairs, or if I climb up a mountain, and I'm at a distance r sub e plus h from the center of the Earth. What, what is going to be the change in delta g associated with that change in the distance from the center of the Earth? And so in order to calculate g at, at an elevation h, we, one way to do it would just be to take the radius of the Earth, add h to it, and then recalculate this whole expression. And our delta g then would be uh, the acceleration due to gravity at sea level minus the acceleration at a at eleva elevation h, which is, which is uh, uh, actually going to be less. Uh, we're further from the center of the Earth, so this will be a positive uh, delta delta g. Um, but it's actually it actually we should reverse the sign because the delta g delta r is going to be negative. Um, we're going to get the 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 acceleration due to gravity is going to get uh, smaller and smaller as h gets larger and larger. So, so that would be uh, something to keep in mind in looking at that expression. But I'd ask you here to take a look at this relationship and what we did here and ask if there's another way to compute the change in the acceleration due to gravity. And uh, you might have immediately thought, well, let's just go ahead and take the derivative of g with respect to r. And so if we calculate dg dr, <clears throat> we're taking this derivative. And that turns out these are constants. We can just move them outside the uh, derivative operation. We're taking the derivative of r to the minus 2 power. And do you remember what that derivative is? Well, we'll come back to that uh, in, a, in, in, the next, uh, in the next video or so. Uh, but let's, let's take a look at delta g delta r in uh, this area of, um, in the area of Morgantown, which is about 40 degrees north latitude. That happens to be about 0 0.3086 milligauss per meter. Or, if we want to do it in feet, that's 0 0.09406 milligauss per foot. So these are pretty small numbers, but we've been talking about anomalies. Remember that uh, karst feature was associated with an, an anomaly that was 0.4 milligauss. So if we're off by a meter, then we have an anomaly uh, that could be equal to the anomaly associated. So the anomaly associated with the karst feature. So we need to know our elevations really well, and we need to compensate for these changes in delta g with uh, changes in elevation. So uh, <clears throat> one half milligal or so that collapse feature, and um, get your elevations wrong, you'd miss it altogether, or you might interpret it uh, as being somewhere else. So if we're dealing with Newton's universal law of gravitation, um, it's all about the mass and the distance. And so if we have a, kind of an arbitrarily shaped object like this big cube over here, um, we, we know that the Spherically shaped objects gravitate as though all their mass were concentrated at the center. Well, this is obviously not a spherically shaped mass. However, if these point, if these little chunks are far enough away, then we consider can consider them also to gravitate as though all their mass were concentrated at, at the center, because the difference in the distances to the different points on the corners and so on is going to be relatively small. So that can make our calculations pretty easy as well. So uh, <clears throat> at any rate, we usually calculate the acceleration of some arbitrarily shaped object like this uh, uh, cube by breaking it up into small parts and summing their individual contributions together. 
parts that are small enough so that we can treat them as points. And then when we do that, we, you know, we have this integral form of Newton's law of gravitation. This could be a line integral, a surface integral, a volume integral. Uh, the acceleration due to gravity then would be an integration uh, along a line, surface, or volume of, we've got this uh, gravitational constant, and the object depends on how we slice it and dice it, this differential element of mass here. And <clears throat> we usually do that depending on its symmetry. So in the symmetry, the object usually determines whether the integration is a line integral, surface, or volume integral. So g in this case, then, is the integral rho. We are, we're assuming that we have an object which is constant density. If we don't, we usually break it up into chunks and then do these integrals separate, separately for each chunk or each uh, layer or each uh, uh, portion of the volume of interest. And uh, then we're really considered in this differential volume element, which we would express it just in Cartesian coordinates, dx, dy, dz. So the integral that we're often evaluating, uh, looking at the inside of a computer program, we would be carrying out an integration over some dx, dy, dz in Cartesian coordinates or, or uh, what, whatever coordinates that you've uh, felt were appropriate for that problem, but it, it's very often it turns out to be a dx, dy, dz for the volume element. So, looking at a spherically shaped object, um, we're going to to um, ask ourselves, okay, well, if, the, if this spherically shaped object gravitates as though all of its mass is concentrated at the uh, center of the sphere, then that makes the problem real simple. We don't have an integral anymore. We just have that g is equal to g times the mass of the sphere over the radius of the sphere squared. So we can treat it, treat the gravitational field on the surface of this sphere, anywhere on the surface of this sphere, as though all the mass were concentrated at the center. So ask yourself, how you would go about um, computing the acceleration due to gravity uh, along a profile that went across a buried sphere like this. And so, you know, we're, what we're doing is we're taking a look at, uh, we've got a gravimeter. Uh, we've got an object, a spherically shaped object over here. It's a distance x away from the, uh, from the gravimeter along the surface and at a depth z. And uh, this is another point that becomes important that we'll talk about uh, later on. We'll talk about in more detail the next time. But the acceleration due to gravity of this object is a, along a direction, is a vector, uh, along a direction pointing towards the center of the object. The gravimeter, on the other hand, is measuring the vertical component of the acceleration due to gravity. So when we ask ourselves, what kind of an anomaly are we going to measure as we go across this buried feature? Well, it's going to depend on whether it's a positive density contrast or a negative density contrast. The gravitational anomaly may drop down or raise up again. But we're going to be thinking in terms of the vertical component of the acceleration due to gravity that we're measuring as we go across the surface. Uh, over this buried sphere in this case, negative or positive de density contrast. So take a few minutes and um, uh, see how you might tackle this problem, and we'll talk about that the next time. Uh, thanks for joining us. Talk to you later.